This video is called a parlor trick and it's intended to mess with your mind a little bit. What I want to do is show you the power of representing information as data and get you to explore some of the data representation choices we maybe take for granted. It's going to be a little weird. You may need to watch it a few times to really enjoy it. So the problem set up is, I don't know, maybe a little crazy. You've just gotten a new tablet and it runs a prototype version of Racket, which is great. You can make your tablet do anything you want. But there's one problem, which is this prototype version of Racket doesn't include numbers as primitive data. There just are no numbers in it at all. Fortunately, it does have cons and first and rest and strings. And you know what the self-referential data definition is for numbers. And you know that it's based on the idea that add one is kind of like cons and sub one is kind of like rest. So you actually know how to solve this problem and define your very own numbers from scratch. Here we go. We'll make a new type called natural. I'm making it all uppercase to distinguish it from the old type called natural. And we'll just say, like the old type, that it's going to be a well-formed self-referential data definition. And it's going to look like this. We're going to say that it could be either empty or it could be cons, an exclamation mark, a string with an exclamation mark on a natural. So you've got a well-formed self-referential data definition there. Empty is clearly the base case. And cons, exclamation mark, natural is the self-reference case. So that's the type comment. But in this case, what's actually trickier than the type comment is the interpretation. What does that mean? Well, it just means this. It's a natural number. And the number of exclamation marks in the list is the number. Let's do some examples. So natural zero is empty. And natural one is cons one exclamation mark onto natural zero. This is one and this is zero. And two is just cons another exclamation mark onto n1. That's two. Let's just run this for just a second and take a quick look. If we go down here in the interaction window, n0 is empty, n1 is a list with one exclamation mark in it, and n2 is a list with two exclamation marks in it. So they're cumbersome to look at. They'd be even more cumbersome to type, but those are new natural numbers. They would be so cumbersome to write out, in fact, that what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the magic of video editing to very quickly get a whole bunch more of them. Now we've got natural numbers 0 through 9 that are relatively easy to type. It's still a little weird looking at that cons. What's really going on here is that these are the primitives that operate on the new kind of natural. 1 is the predicate 0 is something zero. And something is zero if what? Well, if it's empty. Because that's what the type comment says. The type comment says, the type comment plus the interpretation says that the way we represent zero is with empty. So that's one primitive. Another primitive is add one. And the way we're going to add one to a natural is, well, we just do this cons thing. And another primitive is sub 1. And the way we're going to get the next smallest natural number is with rest. Even though these are primitives, let me just write the signatures for them off to the side so we'll have them. We've never defined primitives like this before. Let's see, zero question mark actually consumes anything. And it produces a Boolean to tell us whether what it consumed was the representation of zero. Add one consumes one of these newfangled naturals and produces one of these newfangled naturals. 
and someone consumes one of these new kinds of naturals, but it has to be bigger than zero. That's a restriction that's kind of like the restriction that rest has, right? Rest won't take empty. Rest needs a cons. Rest needs a list that's at least one long. So if you give sub one a natural that's at least one or bigger, you'll get back another natural. And if we want, we could pretty this up a little bit. So there's our primitives. Now let's do the template. We'll do it like this. Fun for natural n. Let's see, it's a one of. I won't write out the template rules used. I'll just say them as I go. That's what we're going to be doing starting next week. So I'll do it in this last video of this week. Con, it's a one of. There's two cases. The first case is atomic distinct. Now remember, that empty really means zero. And the reason I wrote these primitives so that was so that we wouldn't go crazy when we saw ourselves calling empty on something that looked like it was supposed to be a natural. So I'm going to say zero here. If the natural is zero, that's atomic distinct. Otherwise, dot, dot, dot. And we'll put in n, because we know it's useful. And we'll say fun for natural sub one of n. And of course, now that I have these primitives, this template looks just like the template for ordinary natural numbers. Because I've got my own special version of zero and my own special version of sub one. So remember, we're doing kind of a weird thing here. We're recreating the numbers. We're recreating the numerals in some sense. Okay, We're recreating the representation of the natural numbers. So there's the template. Now let's do some functions. Well, we've got zero, add one, and sub one. One thing we don't have is plain old add, right? We don't have a way of adding together two naturals. So let's do that. Well, it's a function that consumes two naturals, and it produces a natural. And its purpose is to produce A plus B, assuming that's the name of the two naturals. I'll do the stub here. We'll call it add. So let's do some examples. Now this function is clearly going to be recursive on one of the numbers. That's what the template is for. I'm going to make it be recursive on the second number. It turns out that works out a little bit better later. It would have worked perfectly fine to make it recursive on the first number, but it'll just simplify things later if I do it this way. So that means my first test should be with a base case for the second argument. So I'll say n2 and n0. 0 is the base case. If I add 2 and 0, I should get 2. And just to make sure the first argument's treated all right, I'll also do something like this. That should be 3, because if I add 2 and 0, I get if I add 0 and 3, I get 3. And now let's make one that actually does some more work. We'll add n3 and n4. This satisfies my at least too long rule, because 4 is bigger than 2. Then we'll get n7. Sure is good that I made those constants, so I don't have to type these naturals out all the time. Doing this with a bunch of consas would be a pain. OK, let's take the template. We'll bring it down here. We'll rename it. We'll rename the recursion. We'll comment out the stub. And we need two parameters. So I'm going to rename this parameter to B. And I'll add a parameter A. And in the recursion, I'll add the parameter A also. So let's see, if I'm adding two numbers, a and b, and b is 0, this is the base case, what's the result? Well, I know from arithmetic, and I also know from this example, 
but the result should be a. If you add a to zero, you get a no matter what a is. What do I do in this case here? Well, I don't know if you remember the way you were originally taught to add in kindergarten, but the basic idea was you would get maybe two piles of sticks, and you would add them together by moving one stick at a time from one pile to the other pile until you only had one pile. And if you counted while you did that, you got the right number. Well, that's what we can do here. Here, we're taking one away from B. So if at the same time we just add one to A, and produce that as our result, then that'll work because if we're, B is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Each time B gets smaller by one, A will get bigger by one. Eventually B will be zero and A will be the sum. So this is addition of two numbers together one at a time. Let's try it. It works. I'll give you a little exercise to do now. If this is blowing your mind a little bit too much, then you don't have to do it, but you might have fun doing it. Finish this. And again, the suggestion I'll make to you is when you get to the template stage, set up the template on the second argument and go ahead and work through this and then restart the video. Or if you don't want to work through it yourself, restart the video right away. So here's my version of subtract. I've got two check expects. Base case one is first. Remember, I'm templating on B. So zero for the second argument. If you subtract zero from two, you get two. If you subtract two from six, you get four. And subtract is a little different than add. Let me just change how I've formatted add here. I'll break that on two lines. The way add works is you add to A while you subtract from B. The way subtract works is you keep taking one away from both A and B until B gets to zero. So that's add and subtract. Let's just look at them. The test pass, that's good. Watch this. Add n2 and n3, so that's adding 2 to 3, gets 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 exclamation marks. Subtract 7, add 2 to n3. 2 plus 3 is 5. 7 minus 5 is 2. There's 2. We're doing all this arithmetic without using any natural numbers that were given to us by Dr. Rackett. We're using our own natural numbers. It's a little bit wacky. Let me just quickly show you how far you can go if you want to keep pushing on this. Here I've got the famous factorial function. Right, Factorial of 0 is 1. And factorial of everything else is the number times fact of 1 less than the number. If you don't know factorial, remember I promised there'd be no math. I promised there'd be no math, so you can just ignore this little bit. That's factorial written for these new natural numbers. Zero is uppercase. It's our special primitive. Sub one is uppercase. Fact is uppercase. Ah, but I'm calling times. We don't actually have times, so you could do times. You could wish for times and then do it. In order to do times, you have to use a technique called an accumulator that we haven't learned yet. That'll be from part two of the course. So. I don't want to go into times. Let me just show you that this works. Fact of 0 is 1. Fact of 3 is 6. Fact of 4 is 24. If you count them, there would be 24. Fact of 8. Mm, it takes a long time to print. Long, long time to print. Very long time to print out this long list of exclamation marks. So what's the moral of the story here? The most important thing is to know when we design programs, we come up with data definitions that represent information. And we can take any data to represent any information we want. 
Now, of course, the underlying hardware makes some primitive data faster than other primitive data. We still haven't finished printing out this representation of fact of eight. Okay? This is a terrible representation of natural numbers. You would never want to use this. I just wanted you to see that you can take the bottom to be anything you want. You can come up with your own numbers. You can come up with your own strings. You can come up with your own lists. You can create any data you want. So as I said at the beginning, that's a little wacky. Most of the time, nearly all the time, you're just going to work with whatever representation of numbers the programming language gives you. Still, it's kind of fun to explore that. And remember, the rest of the material this week is not wacky. The rest of the material this week is essential. Representing arbitrary size information, well-formed self-referential type comments, operating on lists, and the reference rule, all of that's essential material. So be sure to practice it a lot, and we'll see you again next week.